All right. Good morning, everyone. Hopefully you are um, being let in okay here. We had a couple technical difficulties, so thank you for um, your patience. But hopefully you are in the right place at Building a Healing-Centered Future, our sixth annual um, Trauma-Informed Awareness Day event sponsored by the Illinois ACES Collaborative. So hopefully everyone is finding their way in this morning, and thank you for your patience. Of course, or despite many years of, of tech, we always have um, a couple challenges. So this morning we will be offering some, um, we will be offering interpretation to Spanish. So I'm gonna go ahead and just greet our Spanish speakers and make sure they're finding their way over there. English speakers, you're gonna stay here. You don't have to do anything. Buenos dias, mi nombre es Kate McCormick. Mi pronombre es ella. Y soy la nueva directora del Illinois ACES Response Collaborative. Estoy encantado de darles la bienvenida. Um, y ahora pueden escoger el canal de español. Um, y si están teniendo problemas, se puede poner las preguntas en el chat. So just greeting our Spanish speakers who are going to be choosing um, the option to go over to the Spanish speaking um, channel. And hopefully we will get that going soon. It looks like there's a little bit of conversation in the chat that maybe that hasn't started yet, but we are working at that. And so si va a empezar el um, interpretación al español muy pronto. So thank you everyone for being here since we did get um, started a little bit late here this morning. I'm going to go ahead and get started right away. Thank you to everyone who's on top of it, putting names and titles in the chat. We love to have that. Um, so I'm thrilled to welcome the more than 450 people who registered for this program and um, everyone who's with us live this morning. I can't see our count, but hopefully it's a good number of you that registered have also made it. And good morning to the Lieutenant Governor who's um, already joined us and, and all set. So we are thrilled to have um, Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton provide our keynote. Um, so some quick housekeeping notes before we get started. The event is being recorded. Um, we're providing interpretation to Spanish, as I mentioned. Hopefully that's getting started. There, We will be offering one CEU for social workers, counselors, and psychologists through the Center for Childhood Resilience. Um, we'll be helping us with that. Um, you do need to sign in and out to get your certificate, and there should be further directions in the chat. So again, I'm not going to go into it because we are um, got started a little late, so you can check the chat. And health and medicine staff um, will be monitoring the chat, and they can answer any general questions over there. Um, I am also going to quickly go over just our agenda for the morning. So uh, we are in the welcome and the housekeeping section with me. Um, then I will pass it over to... Oh, and here's our nice housekeeping, just a couple of reminders. So CEU's chat interpretation recording. We also will email materials out to you after this, anyone who registered. Um, I will be doing the welcome. Then Myra Diaz will introduce our keynote speaker, the Lieutenant Governor, um, who will provide our keynote for today. And then she will be followed by a panel of leaders in the field who will be facilitated by our own Deputy Director, Gita Krishnaswamy. And our panelists include, include today, Colleen Shikhetti, the Executive Director of the Center for Ch Childhood Resilience, Dr. Kieran Joshi, Joshi, Chief Medical Officer for the Cook County Department of Health, Kathy Calderon, Director of Mental Health Operations, and Rosalia Salgado, a parent leader from Kofi. So we are so thrilled to have so many amazing people today. After the panel, we'll have some questions, um, calls to action, and then our closing. So that's what you can be prepared for today. And again, we got started a little bit late, so I'm just trying to watch my time here this morning. Um, but thank you all, everyone, for being here. I think it really shows how much passion and commitment so many people have for this issue. And over a long going, uh, uh, it's been a long period of time, right, that we've been around. So thank you, everyone, again, for being here. I feel really lucky to be stepping into the role of the director of the Illinois ACES Response Collaborative. Uh, my career, I feel like, and my education has been shaped by the work of some of the incredible leaders um, in the trauma-informed and healing-centered care movements. And I am really grateful to them um, for all that they have done um, to get us to this point. Um, there are too many people who have played important roles to name them all here. I had a list going and um, it got really long. So I would like to just ask us all, um, we can just take a mindful moment um, to remember and be thankful for the mentors, the teachers, and leaders in our lives and in this movement. Um, and you're welcome to list some of those in the chat if you would like. Um, I know people are still introducing themselves as well, though. So um, no pressure on that. So we'll just take a moment. And for people joining us, we're just taking a moment to think to ourselves about the people who have um, mentored us. And it will be a short moment since we got started late. But thank you all for doing that. 
Um, I will briefly share the history of the Health and Medicine Policy Research Group um, by sharing three names that are important to know, Dr. Quinton Young, John McKnight, and our current Executive Director, Margie Shapps. Dr. Young and John McKnight, along with other committed health justice activists, founded Health and Medicine Policy Research Group in 1981 to create, to create a policy organization that would uncover and challenge health inequities in Illinois. Under the committed leadership of Margie Shapps, the organization has grown and um, now includes several work areas, and you're welcome to see our website if you would like more details on that. Um, and the Illinois ACEs Response Collaborative grew from what was originally a study group in 2011 into um, what we are today. So the collaborative engages in research, we conduct training, and we bring groups together to design and pro promote policy and systems change. Um, so we often ask organizations to share bright spot programs so that we can highlight the many, many efforts happening across our state. The trauma-informed and healing-centered care movement is really large and so many people are doing incredible things. Um, so today in light of kind of introducing myself, I'm gonna just share one of my bright spot moments from my, career, my own career, um, which happened last December when the parent council or Concilio de Padres, and I know many of them are here today, a group of parent and caregiver leaders who were trained and supported by our system of care project in King County, as well as community organizing and family issues, a great organization and one of our panelists is from that organization today, received an award for their work. The parent and caregiver leaders were recognized for providing a therapeutic model of dropping peer support in Spanish at a local safety net behavioral health agency. These peer support groups and the other outreach efforts um, that the council was engaged in had increased the participation and engagement of Spanish speaking and Latin A families in behavioral health services. Um, so that was a really incredible moment. Of course, it took us a while to get there and there were many challenges along the way. And as we all worked together, um, as well on that project and others, we often return to a line from a famous poem originally written in Spanish, uh, written in Spanish, Hacemos el camino al andar, which we loosely translate to English as we make the road by walking, or as everyone on this call has probably said at some point, we're making the plane as we fly it. Um, and so I share that story because it's the story of the power of parents and caregivers. It's also this my story, a new bureaucrat trained by leaders from this movement, um, to focus on uplifting parent and community voice and the wonderful results we had. Um, and it's also the story of our highest elected officials um, who have decided to put their talent, time, and energy into uplifting priorities such as racial justice, health equity, trauma-informed and healing-centered care, and accessible behavioral health. The commitment of L Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton, Governor J.B. Pritzker, and many other leaders to behavioral health and public health um, are moving us toward a trauma-informed Illinois. And while we can't deny the challenges of this time in our world, I feel really lucky to live and work in a state where leaders are committed to transforming our state and to making the road by walking. As someone in mid-career, I'm also thankful to get to learn from professionals younger than me who bring new ideas and their own idealism and passion to the field. I will now introduce one such amazing person and professional, Myra Diaz, the policy analyst with the Illinois ACEs Response Collaborative Team, who's played a key role in supporting the Lieutenant Governor's Healing Center Task Force and many of the collaborative's other initiatives. Um, so Myra Diaz, I will pass the mic to you. Thank you so much, Kate. And I'm just gonna give a quick uh, announcement to our Spanish speakers that are with us this morning. Uh, buenos días. Este, si ustedes quieren escuchar el programa en español, ahorita estamos teniendo algunos problemas con la tecnología, entonces um, lo estamos resolviendo ahorita. Eh, muchas gracias por su paciencia. Nosotros le dejamos saber en el chat ya en cuanto al canal de español está disponible. Um, good morning, everyone. It's really good to be in community with all of you this on this special occasion. Today, we are truly honored to have with us a remarkable leader whose dedication, leadership, and unwavering commitment to serving our communities in Illinois has made an indelible mark on our state. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton. Lieutenant Governor Stratton serves as Illinois' 48th Lieutenant Governor. She is the state's first African-American woman and fourth woman overall to serve in this role. As Lieutenant Governor, her portfolio includes leading the Justice, Equity, and Opportunity Initiative and chairing the Illinois Council on Women and Girls, the Governor's Rural Affairs Council, the Military Economic Development Council, and the Illinois Rivers Coordinating Council. 
More recently, she launched and became chair of the Healing Centered Illinois Task Force to advance trauma-informed and healing-centered systems change across the state. Lieutenant Governor Stratton previously served as director of the Center for Public Safety and Justice at the University of Illinois at Chicago, executive director of the Cook County Justice Advisory Council, and as a deputy hearing, deputy hearing commissioner for the City of Chicago uh, Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection, all with a focus on improving public safety and building stronger communities. As a lifelong advocate for youth and creating safe spaces for our young people, Lieutenant Governor Stratton is a restorative justice practitioner and trained Peace Circle Keeper. She was also a founding board member of the Children's Ch of Chicago Children's Advocacy Center and served on the board of directors of the Juvenile Protection Association. Lieutenant Governor Stratton was born and raised on the south side of Chicago. She is a proud graduate of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and DePaul University's College of Law. She and her husband, Brian, live in the Bronzeville community and have four daughters. And when she can find a bit of time, she enjoys going to concerts, a good documentary, and training for marathons and triathlons. So Lieutenant Governor Stratton, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this morning. And the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Myra, for that warm introduction. Good morning, everyone. I am Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton. She, her pronouns, and I certainly want to acknowledge Executive Director Margie Shops and say thank you to the Health and Medicine Policy Research Group and Illinois ACES Response Collaborative for inviting me to join this important conversation. To the upcoming panelists, Dr. Karan Joshi, Colleen Cicchetti, Kathy Calderon, and Rosalia Salgado, thank you for gifting us with your insight. And finally, to everyone who is joining us virtually this morning, thank you for dedicating your time to uplift our communities through healing. I'd like to start by sharing just a little bit about my own history. You know, long before I became an elected official, I was trained as a peace circle keeper and restorative justice practitioner. Now, as a lawyer, I use that background and training to dedicate my career to uniting communities and redefining how the law impacts vulnerable communities. I started my own alternative dispute resolution firm and worked as a mediator, arbitrator, and administrative law judge because I knew that the best resolutions to conflict were born out of building relationships and through effective communication. What I now understand is that all of those experiences were preparing me for the journey that I now find myself on, leadership. While my entire career was spent in public service, when I decided to run for office, I did so with the intention of becoming a voice for the unheard. I did so with the intention of healing harm, not perpetuating it. And to this day, my goal is to lead in relationship with the people that I represent. Because of my background in restorative justice, I was prepared to encounter the ugly truth about trauma's lasting footprint. And rather than approach with fear, I made a choice and still make that choice every single day to approach these issues with curiosity, including the issue of trauma and its intergenerational impact. This has allowed me and my team to not just recognize the impact of trauma, but also to identify its many shapes. For some, trauma is gun violence. For others, trauma is food insecurity and being deprived of basic essentials like healthcare. Trauma is long-term disinvestment in communities where you leave your home and there's no place to grab a cup of coffee with your neighbor or no park or green space where you feel safe to let your children play. It means so many different things. And in many instances, trauma is fueled by deeply rooted racism. When our country was built, largely thanks to the blood, sweat, and tears of Black people, inequity was mixed into the concrete that now braces our education, economic, healthcare, and criminal legal systems. Trauma can be obvious, ugly, and bloody. It can be nuanced, sneaking, 
and hard to see. But regardless of its form, trauma drains life from our communities. Fortunately, our administration understands this threat and we are committed alongside all of you to changing the status quo. My office houses the Justice, Equity and Opportunity Initiative. It's JEO as we call it. And it's a healing driven effort to rethink Illinois' criminal legal system and transition away from punitive measures toward equitable, restorative and inclusive practices. Last year, JEO convened a group of subject matter experts, including the Health and Medicine Policy Resource Group, excuse me, research group, with the goal of pushing Illinois to adopt a more trauma-informed and healing-centered justice system. In August of last year, Governor Pritzker signed the bill creating the Healing-Centered Illinois Task Force and further empowered JEO's work to make Illinois a more trauma-informed and healing-centered state. The task force, which was formally launched in January of this year, aims to coordinate existing projects, identify the impact of intergenerational trauma to develop preventive solutions and viable resources, and facilitate broader community engagement. Our goal is really to restructure how trauma-informed and healing-centered principles are applied to the policy-making process. Now, the task force carries urgency because the risks we take by ignoring trauma are simply too costly to bear. By uplifting existing resources and imagining new solutions through a healing-centered approach, we expand how we respond to trauma and push Illinois further down the road to transformation. We're fostering collaboration between state and local governments, advocates, and trauma-informed experts. And guided by research and the wisdom of those living with traumatic experiences, we are investing in Illinois' public safety and in the long-term health of our communities. And I simply want to close by saying thank you. Thank you for the work that each of you are doing to heal our state and our shared world. We know that, he, that hurt people hurt people, right? We've said that and we know that. But each of us remains committed to this work because we also know that healed people heal people. And with that, we'll keep doing this work and we'll do it together committed to healing our communities, recognizing the healing that each of us need ourselves and that we need each other to walk this road of healing together. So thank you. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Deputy Director Gita Krishnaswamy. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for those remarks and good morning, everyone. Thank you for being with us this morning. Um, again, my name is Geetha Krishnaswamy and I'm the Deputy Director at Health and Medicine Policy Research Group. This year, I've actually been fortunate to serve as a member of the Healing Center Task Force led by the Lieutenant Governor. And that's given me a close view of her deep commitment to creating safe, healing communities for people of all ages and backgrounds. And so Lieutenant Governor, again, we really appreciate you joining us again to commemorate Trauma-Informed Awareness Day and for your thoughtful reflections as always on doing this work. Um, and, and doing it with curiosity, um, I really appreciated what hearing you talk about the fact that we need to understand that trauma can show up in ugly and obvious ways um, and nuanced ways. And so as we're leading in this work and thinking about our leadership, it's important to do that with curiosity um, and, and to do that in relationship with each other. We're going to be shifting now to the panel portion of our morning, which is going to take place in two parts. For the first, um, I've prepared a few questions for our panelists. 
And some of those integrate questions that today's attendees submitted during registration for today's event. So I think you'll hear um, some of the things that you were curious about in our conversation. Um, but for the second part of the panel, we have, we have still set aside some additional time to address new audience questions that arise today. So if you would like to submit a question for one of our panelists or a question for all, um, as we are as we are talking this morning, you can find the Q and A icon um, on your Zoom control panel. And when you click that icon, you'll see a pop up on your screen where you can submit questions to us. Um, we ask that you submit questions to the Q and A box rather than the chat, so we can effectively track the questions that are coming in but you're welcome to continue sharing reactions uh, in, in our chat and engaging with each other in the chat. Um, in a moment, I'm going to be asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves and um, quick request to my tech support. I'm hoping that we can get um, my screen pinned as well as our panelists pinned um, as we're entering into the panel. So I think we need that to happen on screen. Um, we're, we're hoping though that you as our audience leave today with a better understanding of some of the work that's happening in our city, county and state. We want you to get inspired about new connections you can make to this work or new ways to collaborate with each other um, and, you know, you'll quickly hear that our panelists represent many years of experience in their respective roles, each one of them important in promoting healing and well-being in our communities. Um, so I hope that those of you listening will resonate with their different perspectives. And for our panelists, um, I encourage you to see this as a, a dialogue amongst yourselves, too, so you can be in conversation with each other. Um, a, a couple quick reminders um, to our panelists, and this is for myself as well, because we do have simultaneous Spanish language interpretation, um, we are trying to speak a little slower than normal and speak very clearly so that our interpreters um, have time to hear us and complete their interpretation. And um, so that we have that time to take audience questions and are able to hear from each of you, I may just raise a hand to signal that we should wrap up a particular question to move on. Um, but we are excited to hear from you. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists and we'll work on um, having you on screen as well. But um, I'm asking our panelists to please share a bit about yourselves, um, introduce yourselves, a bit about your background. And we'd like to hear about some of the highlights of contributions that you or your organization have made to trauma-informed healing-centered work. And I'm going to ask Kathy, please, to kick off those introductions. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias a todos. Um, my name is Kathy Calderon. I use she, her pronouns. I serve as the Director of Mental Health Operations at the Chicago Department of Public Health. I'm happy to be here and thank you all for listening in to have this important conversation. Um, you know, I am a clinician at heart and by training. So I, ser I am an LCPC and have served in community mental health for many years, working with youth and families and the complex systems in which they work within. Um, I have extension extensive training in trauma-informed practices, and particularly I'm uh, trained um, in NMT, the Neurosequential Model of Therapeutics, um, at, developed by Dr. Bruce Perry. And so that um, framework drives my trauma-informed approach, but also what I like about the model and my experience in the trauma-informed space is that we want to embrace any intervention that is healing and what that looks like and really to emphasize connection. So I'm sure you'll hear that throughout time. Um, at my In my role at the department, I work on large-scale city-level mental health equity initiatives and 
I sit within the Office of Mental Health and the Behavioral Health Bureau. So I wanna give a huge shout out to all my colleagues in violence prevention, substance use, and mental health. We do a ton of work and I think trauma-informed care and healing center practices really binds us all in this work across the Behavioral Health Bureau. So thank you everyone for doing this work. Um, I manage our mental health partnership and coordination team. So really um, cultivate deep relationships across our mental health safety net system, those who are doing mental health services, um, figuring out ways to get healing opportunities out to increase access to care and really coordinate across all of our stakeholders who are doing the work within government and within our um, ecosystem in Chicago. So I'm glad to be here with all of you and thank you for having me. I think I'm up next. My name is Colleen Cicchetti. I'm a psychologist by training and work closely with Kathy and many of you on this call. Um, my role is that I am a psychologist and the executive director at the Center for Childhood Resilience at Lurie Children's and Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine. I also serve as the clinical director of the Illinois Childhood Trauma Coalition, a group that's been fighting for trauma-informed practices and healing-centered practices for 20 years. I'm very excited to be here today as both an appointed member of the task force that the Lieutenant Governor spoke about, and also to really highlight some of the important work that our Center for Childhood Resilience has done in the last few years to create a statewide model for trauma responsive schools that we have really used as a um, blueprint to think about much of this work. The work there has done like many of, lots of our work, moved from trauma aware promotion to trauma responsive to really thinking about what does healing center look like? As the Lieutenant Governor said, really thinking about what, what can we do differently that's not just being responsive to the trauma that our communities are experiencing, but to really move into thinking differently about all of these systems, engaging our communities, our families, our children, our elders to really make this state different than other states. So super excited to be working with all of you today and have a chance to talk about some of this work and how we can keep it going. It's the 20 year anniversary of the Illinois Child Trauma Coalition and we're really, really proud and excited that our state is such a leader in all of this work once again with the Lieutenant Governor's leadership. I think I'm up next here. Hi everyone, I'm Kieran Joshi. I'm a senior medical officer at the Cook County Department of Public Health. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, our agency is the uh, Health Department for Suburban Cook County. Uh, so thankful to Health and Medicine for both convening this uh, incredible group of people, uh, particularly this panel. Uh, so thankful for the opportunity to address this, this group. Uh, particularly thankful for our Lieutenant Governor's comments um, and appreciated her framing of the idea that um, healing people can, can heal others. Um, I think that's that's really critical and really crucial and is, is a concept that has certainly informed our work um, at CCDPH. Um, our agency sits in Cook County Health, uh, which is the public um, health care delivery system for Cook County. Um, and we're really fortunate in that we uh, are responsible for convening the health system-wide uh, trauma-informed collaboratives. So we convene stakeholders across our health system to explore ways that we can advance uh, trauma-informed and healing-centered approaches. Um, happy to share more about that as uh, this group, as this discussion progresses. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. Um, thank you for those introductions. And I have to say, I uh, did ask our panelists to keep their introductions brief so we would get to our questions, but I'm always impressed that people with this amount of experience and passion are able to actually talk about themselves and their work um, in, in such a brief amount of time. So um, thank you all for that. And I know uh, hearing, hearing just a little bit about the work that you do is making me excited to delve into our conversation this morning. So um, I want to start uh, with a question for both Kieran and Kathy, and um, either one of you can can jump in to respond to this first. Um, I know that the 
you know, the emergency of the COVID-19 pandemic is still very much on many of our minds. And it's, it's the most prominent recent event that's reminded us of how vital collaboration is between different entities to support the public's health. So I'm curious to hear from both of you, um, what are lessons that we can apply from the pandemic to supporting behavioral health in our communities? And you know, what are the opportunities for collaboration between the city and county uh, to support behavioral health and have a, a bigger, more expansive impact? I think um, perhaps I can start and then happy to yield sure. to, to Kathy on this. Um, so first I would say, um, <clears throat> pardon, and pardon me, I am gonna try to slow down my, um, um, to slow down here a little bit so that um, the translators can, can proceed. Um, first, I would say, I think it's uh, sort of a cliche at this point to say that the pandemic really laid bare the inequities that um, we knew already existed. Um, if you looked at the um, people that died disproportionately from COVID, the people that were being hospitalized disproportionately from COVID, it was predominantly individuals who were people of color. And we know that the reason for that to be really explicit were related to the so-called structural determinants of health, right? So systemic racism, systemic barriers that people face. Um, and so these are really societal issues. They're societal problems. And ultimately they require societal solutions. So that's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take really activated, um, sharp people like some of the folks that are leading the trauma-informed work on this panel to advance system change, policy change over time. Um, and so I think uh, we have a sense of what needs to happen. And I think I see us moving in the right direction. So I'm very hopeful. Um, but in, in a way, I, I feel like we can't move uh, quickly enough. With respect to specific collaborations between ourselves and my colleagues at the city, um, we've done, I think, some really great work in the overdose prevention space, um, thinking of behavioral health broadly uh, in terms of collaborating on surveillance data, uh, collaborating on approaches to address overdoses. I would love to see that kind of work grow. Um, again, always with an eye towards uh, system change. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there because I don't want to take up too much time here, but again, happy to, to answer questions as they arise. Would love to hear from, from my colleague at the city. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, ag I agree with everything you said. I mean, we are aware of disparities and historical um, issues with our our system of care and the fragmentation that occurs, especially for those that have different needs and com complexities within their trauma histories. Um, and so within the pandemic, it, we faced a global collective trauma together. And so we were, um, we were faced with the challenge of pivoting in many ways very quickly. And it forced us to adopt different practices to address some really big um, concerns and also people were being stripped of many things that were, you know, basic to their needs around being isolated from loved ones. And so I think um, really, I remember when the pandemic, when, when the onset of it kind of sitting with it, thinking about the long-term effects and what that would look like. And so I think it shined the light on mental health and people being in about looking at that. I think particularly in the health department, we saw significant investments, which kind of forced us to develop infrastructure that was not previously there very quickly in order to get these funds out quick and to be intentional and to connect with our colleagues um, around how do, we, how do we really address these inequities as they're happening and across the city, right? Because especially when it comes to mental health, 
we we see that need everyone experienced behavioral health harm um, within the pandemic and we have a workforce that is struggling as well and so or and also we need more people and so I think we have pivoted a lot to think creatively and innovative about how we can support each other um, as professionals to really think about what people are going through um, and then how do we leverage each each other in the roles that we do um, so that we can really support those and and move the work forward. And so it, when it comes to coordination, um, we can't do that alone. And so working county, working with leaders like Colleen in terms of being able to leverage their work, we can't go back. We don't have time to start over. Um, we need to come together and to move forward. And I, I think that work, um, you know, since 2020 has really shown the um, the opportunity there to collaborate. It said my internet is unstable. I hope it's not coming across that way, but I will stop there. We've been able to hear you really well, Kathy. Thank you. Um, Colleen, hearing from Kieran and Kathy, I'm, I'm wondering um, from, you know, from your position um, being in a hospital system, um, but involved with much other work throughout the city and state, um, if you have a uh, additional thoughts or a reaction to what you heard from them. I just want to underscore what they both said, which is that this is not an easy thing to solve and it's not going to be an easy thing to um, do unless we all work together. So I think I agree with both of them that the public health model is something that many people were not familiar with until the pandemic. And now there's a much greater awareness of all of the issues that people like Kathy and Kieran have been working on for their whole careers around we can't just address what happens when kids or adults show up for care, but we have to really be thinking about what do we do differently to change the systems and to promote health and wellness. And I think that's going to be a real shift. And so I think it's an exciting time as a healthcare provider. Um, I also, I sort of lead the public health arm of my department of psychiatry. And I'd say that as our health system starts to really adopt the idea that it's the responsibility of healthcare systems, not just to treat, but to prevent and to promote and to work together, what you're talking about in terms of this kind of collaboration and bringing best practices and and what I often try to highlight is the critical need for diverse voices in this. We each bring our expertise and every single person on this call has a perspective and an expertise. And so do all the folks that we treat and, and serve in our state. And so we really have to be innovative and open to that type of collaboration. And I think that's what the Child Trauma Coalition has tried to do. And certainly what I think needs to happen as we move forward in this statewide effort. Great, thank you. That might be actually be a little segue to another question I wanted this group to think about. However, we have been joined by our fourth panelist who, through no fault of her own, uh, had some trouble joining us this morning. So I do want to rewind so that she can introduce herself um, to our audience as well. So, um, Rosalia, sorry for the trouble this morning. And no, no. Um, <laughs> yes, welcome. Good morning. Our other panelists did have a chance to introduce themselves, but I want you to have that same opportunity. So would you please share uh, a little bit about your background, the organization you're affiliated with? And we would love to hear some highlights about contributions that you or your organization have made to trauma-informed and healing-centered work in your community. Definitely. Thank you. And yes, I apologize. We all know how those technical difficulties can be. So uh, thank you for allowing me to do this myself. Um, so I'm Rosalia Salgado. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, and I am from the organization um, Kofi Power Pack Illinois, um, which stands for Community Organizing Family Issues. Um, I'm a parent leader there with Kofi, um, and I'm also the co-chair of the Early Learning Campaign. Um, so I have a few things going on there, but those are the most of the big things that I do. And I'm also a big champion for trauma there at Kofi Power Pack Illinois. 
Um, some ways we are advancing, and I can share some of the things that we're up to. Um, we're advancing, contributing are by having our parents be present um, in important spaces. Um, we think that's very important in order for us to contribute, uh, where they feel heard and they feel that they are setting, you know, making change within their communities. Uh, for example, some of the things we're doing, as many of our parents have been uh, providing, they have provided surveys within their low income communities um, to see, you know, how their uh, community members have been feeling with everything past post COVID, um, stresses, anxieties. Um, and many of the Kofi parents actually did these surveys themselves. Uh, they did one on one, peer to peer. Uh, they did surveys within their school, jobs, um, anywhere that they could within their community, actually. Um, they were building, we are continuing to build relationships within um, our low income communities. Um, building trust with similarities is something that we've been working on as well. Uh, building the trust within our parents um, in low-income communities. Um, we are also, some of our parents have also been trained. Uh, we've had enough training to assist and guide parents through difficult times and emotions, um, like net training, SMC training, which would be like survivor moms training. Um, we are aware that it's not the same as being a therapist. Uh, but we also are aware that peer-to-peer uh, -peer work is working and having one-on-ones with people that you can relate with in your community uh, seems to be working a lot as well. Um, basically being like a companion to anyone that needs any assistance is what we are uh, practicing and working on within our communities and our work. Um, we are also have um, excited to have some of us on the Centered um, Illinois Task Force and we're looking forward to um, working with everybody on there. And we all have a common goal that is very much important to many people, um, including yourself. And so I wanna thank everyone that attended this webinar because that just goes to show that you, you care about this work. So uh, thank you for that. Um, and that's just a little bit about myself and where I uh, work with and my peers. Um, yeah, I'll yes. catch on. <laughs> Yes, I, yes, you can take a moment to get settled and we are really glad that you could be with us. So you, um, you, I'm fortunate to be able to um, collaborate with you as well as Colleen on the Healing Center Task Force. So um, maybe let me ask a question about that because this, this statewide task force, you know, really has great potential to help us uh, not just align our language and understanding of concepts related to trauma and healing, um, but you know, our hope is that this task force is helping us, all of us who are engaged in this work, align our goals and our efforts. Um, so I, I'm curious, um, Rosalia and Colleen especially, um, you know, what opportunities are you seeing right now for different partners, like the folks in our audience today, to be informed about the, the current work of the task force and to engage with the task force? Um, and Rosalia, maybe you could take this question first. Um, I'm especially curious to hear from you how, how you'd like to see parent leaders and community members be able to be informed and engaged with this work. Definitely. So um, firstly, the opportunities that I see for partners in the audience, uh, I would say finding out about how you can get involved with the people that are part of the task force. Um, I think that's very important. We know that there are a few of us there involved and everyone's working on beautiful things that um, are contributing to the mental health. Uh, so everybody has, you know, their own little plan and project. So I really would encourage people to get to know the members of the task force and possibly just um, get involved in the things that they're doing and other efforts that um, that they're trying to accomplish within their either organizations or their providers, uh, maybe asking them how you can support them. Um, I think that building relationships is very important. So uh, maybe building those relationships within the people that are in the task force can help you and help us just move it along as a team because it's a, you know, we're a team overall all together. Um, and most importantly, keep asking questions, right? <laughs> keep asking questions um, and also never make assumptions of what you might think is going on in the task force or what you might think is going right or wrong. Um, 
always feel free to ask and just reach out for more information. Uh, I think that those are definitely great ways um, that the audience could get involved with us. And speaking about opportunities that exist for parent leaders and community members, I would really say that um, opportunities for leaders would be sharing uh, what we know with the rest of our community. I know myself, I see a leader as somebody that uh, shares that knowledge, right? That shares that knowledge and continues to contribute everything that you learn and you know. Um, so, so like myself, I'm going to be, you know, taking back all this information to Kofi and even what I learned within the task force. And it creates a beautiful chain reaction where you have people really engaging and wanting to be part of the table and be present and really just mentioning what they're learning um, within other communities. So that's great. Um, as I mentioned, it's a privilege to be here also because I get to share all that um, experience. Um, I think parent leaders, it's also very important for parent leaders and community members to share their stories and to share their truth. Um, I think that's a big, important contribution to this work. Um, I think that stories and truth um, are very impactful and the stories and truth statewide. Um, I know I mentioned a lot of low-income communities, but this is a statewide thing, right? So we want to make sure that all communities and all cultures are being heard. And um, I think that that would be a great contribution to this work. So then they also feel like they are making that change within the system. Wonderful. <clears throat> and I would just add, I, you know, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think Rosalia captured the energy of this. And I think just wanting to underscore that there are opportunities built into this process for community engagement. So in addition to having members like Rosalia on the committee, as well as some youth members, we as a committee have made sure that we are part of the Open Meetings Act. So all of our monthly meetings are open and we invite people to come and make public comment. We're creating sub committees now to really do the work to design what this is going to look like to create a blueprint for the state. And I am sure that the lieutenant governor, knowing who she is, is going to make sure that we follow best practices and bring out um, these ideas for public comment and for communication. I also know that there's going to be an opportunity for the different systems themselves. So if you think about various systems that serve our cities and state, we're thinking about things like child welfare, justice, schools, health departments, all of those groups and the Department of Aging are going to be asked to think about what do they individually as a system, both as a lead entity of the state, but also the critical partners around them need to build individually and specifically. And so in that work, um, although we haven't gotten there yet, my guess in my gut tells me that there will be requirements that people who've been served by those different organizations are engaged in that process. So I think it's really important. This work is something that has been grassroots that we are now bringing sort of the top down approach to, which we've been fighting for for 20 years. Um, but we still, I think, ultimately have to recognize that the grassroots and the people who are on the front lines experiencing these traumas, but also serving all of the different ways that we serve um, need to have their voices at the table to make sure that Illinois really is the role model. So there'll be there'll be structured ways as well as less formal ways, I'm sure. So please, please feel invited to engage with us. Yeah, and I I like um I guess I I'm hoping that we can do this with a, a grass tops approach, uh, knowing where the work came from and now that we're doing this together as a state. I am curious, Kieran and Kathy, you know, being located and, you know, working for the county and the city, knowing that we have this statewide task force um, that is in a planning process right now, um, you know, what are your hopes for getting plugged into this work and, and um, hopes for how, you know, how a statewide plan could support or facilitate some of the work that you want to do? I can jump in. That's okay. Um, I think there i hear so often i didn't know you were doing that at the department or i didn't know that this existed and we we work hard to stand up really big initiatives and build really amazing connections um sometimes we're just not fully connected because there's so much happening out there which is amazing but also um really slowing down to look at the opportunities for connections and so i know for those of 
you who have worked who I've worked with more closely hear me talk a lot about the intervention point and what are the actionable items that we can do as we get there so that we can really move forward together and, and stay connected. I think sometimes, especially in the city, we work so hard to set an event up or a convening and then time goes by and, and we lose track. And so it's really a matter of developing consistency, predictability and ongoing connection so that we can stay attuned to our work. And I think that comes through with our relationships and being able to get to know each other over time, checking in with each other. We know we go through things. And so being able to touch base with people and pick up um, where people left off and there's so many moving parts. And so I think, especially when we're looking at such a, the, you know, a high level view, 20, thousand foot view, it, it's important to really respect and understand um, where everyone was coming from, what is happening, but knowing that we need to come together to gain that momentum. And so I really, I would love to hear kind of to have touch points, be able to tell you all about what the city is doing and what the mechanisms are for us to stay connected. So we have, you know, within my body of work, we just launched a suicide prevention initiative. We have a website that will be posting ongoing free trainings. People can request trainings um, and there will be a lot more opportunity for dialogue around suicide. So I would love to invite anyone who's doing that work um, to talk with our team in our Office of Violence Prevention. Really want to give a shout out to Marlita and Corey and Eric team um, within the department. They are doing some really amazing trauma-informed training cohorts. And so I can drop um, that information in the chat. And so I think those are mechanisms to be able to convene around and to share that information. And then also the more the rip, developing positive ripple effects so that we can get those connections and information out there. And it just becomes part of the scene and, and part of how we um, build up our work together. Thank you. Kieran, anything to add to that? I think uh, I'm going to defer that question, actually, because I know there are more um, sure. questions. And I think my colleague said it beautifully. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Um, well, so I actually do want to move to the last question that I have for the panel. And I'm getting alerts that we have some good audience questions. So I want to get to those, too. Um, so I, I do want to hear from each of you. Um, so let's imagine that one year from now, um, we'll be back together uh, on, on Zoom together, uh, commemorating another Trauma-Informed Awareness Day. Uh, and I, I'd like to hear from each of our panelists, what would be two things that you'd be looking for um, by the end of that year that would make you feel like we're succeeding in advancing a unified trauma-informed healing-centered um, blueprint for our city, county, or state. Uh, and Rosalia, I'll ask you to respond to this first. Thank you. Um, two things. I was like, two things. I wanted to do two. <laughs> uh, but uh, something that I would uh, want to see change definitely within my community would be um, one being like the long wait list. For families, um, I really want, um, you know, low-income communities to have easier access for those services. Um, I know that that would also take time, but just within, you know, that time, hopefully have uh, more access, easier access, better translation for our state, um, not just in Spanish, but in all languages. Um, and also um, uh, something that's very important to me would be taking care of our young adults. Um, I know that we talk a lot about mental health with, you know, children and everything, but I think that our young adults are very important. And uh, by the end of, you know, the year, I would like to see that specifically uh, the men, the young men of our state. Um, so I just think that that's something that I would like to see change, but definitely translations um, and definitely better access uh, within our low income communities and especially um, definitely having providers that can relate and you know, looks like us in our community and the people are my community not feel so intimidated. So um, those are some efforts that I hope that we can have and um, continue to work on, even if it does not happen, you know, in this year, we will continue to do that. And until, until it does. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Well, we're going to try to make everything happen we can within a year. 
Um, Kathy, what about you? Two things that we could look forward to in a year from now. I would say momentum and deeper connections, really um, aligning our efforts and moving forward with the work that we're doing. I think there's so much opportunity here and we have made great strides. And so coming back, reflecting on that process and acknowledging and expressing gratitude around it and then continuing to evolve our work and develop the nuanced ways that are in there to continue to move um, forward together. Wonderful. Colleen, I know you're dreaming big. What do you have for us? Yeah, that's a hard one. Of course, the blueprint. Let's start with that. I hope that we right. have a budget <laughs> and a plan to move the blueprint forward and not have it be dependent on um, stop start funding of grants. That's been a challenge. So particularly in my domain, I hope that we have really been able to ascertain the funds that we need to move the REACH project statewide. Um, I hope at this point next year, we have 4,000 schools across the state, including every school in the state, K-12, getting a data snapshot of how they are in this work and then a very clear blueprint with resources and coaching to move it forward. Um, I think that's going to be absolutely essential and will be um, a game changer for kids and families in our state. Uh, and the second one I would say that's directly involved with you is that, as you know, Gita, we've been really looking at all of the different stakeholder groups and um, communities and volunteers coming together. And there's so many tables that cross with cross purposes and trying to do the work. So I hope by next year, we have launched a new Healing Centered Illinois Coalition that combines the work of Illinois ACE and the Child Tra Trauma Coalition and so many other efforts into one organization so that there's a direct mechanism to engage with the clinicians and direct service providers and communities across multiple spaces. We have learned that by having this big coalition, we can pivot when a new need arises. So for example, we, we were able to launch a refugee and immigrant subgroup within the Child Trauma Coalition really quickly that brought all kinds of people together when that need was the most urgent. And we have seen similar things happen. So we, we really need to be looking forward to next year, having that new organization that's really trying to bring everyone together to do the work in addition to what we hope to build within the state system. Yeah, absolutely. I'm with you and we're excited that we have a new Illinois ACEs Response Collaborative Director, Kate McCormack, who can help us get to that vision. And uh, as a former classroom teacher, what you said about having all schools in the state uh, on this roadmap really resonated with me too. Um, Kieran, would you uh, close out this question and we wanna hear about your vision for a year from now? Yeah, I think, thanks, Geetha. So clearly, Kate um, has her work cut out for her. Uh, <laughs> yes. Lots of opportunity there, Kate. So looking forward to working with you. Um, I would say, you know, I think that um, when, when we think about trauma, again, you heard my earlier comments about um, a lot of what we're seeing in our communities, um, in our regions, in our state, being driven by societal forces. Um, and I think it's really important as leaders to acknowledge that. So you know, for example, in the healthcare space and health systems broadly, we see like a lot of provider burnout. We saw that en masse throughout COVID. We saw uh, people leaving the field. Why are these things happening? Um, it wasn't simply just COVID. I, I think it's the result of an accumulation of trauma, uh, of moral injury, if you will. Um, and I think it really relates to moral injuries stemming from um, just like a lack of an understanding that healthcare, that health has this intrinsic value, um, that it can't just be monetized. Um, so I think it's important to sort of think about this as we're thinking about uh, trauma-informed approaches and implementing them in the healthcare space in particular. Um, so the reason for that, of course, is that oftentimes we sort of go back to this idea of training, like and I would say that I don't think we're going to train our way out of the problems that we have. We really need system change. And I think the beautiful thing about this convening, about um, the, the statewide task force, is that they really open the door for those of us that are trying to do this, this work on the ground and give us permission 
to work with, with leadership, um, with thought leaders, with executives, um, to sort of communicate the importance of taking trauma-informed approaches and building healthcare delivery systems that are truly focused on healing. So thank you. Okay, great. So that does bring us to the end of the first part of our panel, but at this time, I'd like to invite health and medicine staff member, Hannah Chevron to go ahead and unmute. Hannah's been monitoring the Q&A submissions um, and I hope choosing a few juicy ones for us to answer. So Hannah, would you let us know um, what the first audience question is? Yes, so the first, I would say, significantly juicy audience question that I would be very curious to hear all panelists' answers to is this question um, from an anonymous attendee, which is, as the field of TIC evolves, there is a greater understanding of what trauma and TIC encompasses. With this, there is acknowledgement that previous interventions need radical change in order to better address trauma and equity. How do we encourage all parties at the table to be more open to radical interventions, such as allowing undocumented individuals to serve as CHWs, justice-involved individuals to serve as CHWs, and harm reduction initiatives to explore unconventional methodologies? That, that is a juicy one. <laughs> I'm happy to jump in a little bit as a clinician. I think <clears throat> what you're describing in that question is so critical. What we know is that things like cognitive behavioral therapy that have become sort of a norm for best practices for a lot of trauma treatment are really useful. They're also really easy to study because they tend to come with manuals. Um, and so it's really easy to know whether someone is implementing something with fidelity. And I think what you're talking about is being willing as the people who do the research and do the policies to consider the fact that there are many, many ways to heal. And that in fact, one of the critical ways that I think you are highlighting is this idea of community navigators or community health workers. What we have seen in the pandemic and also in our work in trauma is having people out in the community with connections in the community, promoting the awareness and promoting that there is a solution, that you're not alone, that there are people who can help and help you heal is really critical. I also think the work of our young people that has really been um, led by people like Voice and Kofi has been part of that as well around the idea that one way that we heal is actually to be engaged in changing the situations that we're in. And I think when we think about the healing centered framework, there's two critical elements that I think are really essential. One is that healing is important, but we don't want people to be limited by the worst thing that ever happened to them. We have to be thinking about not just how the traumas impacted them, but what they have in their own individual strengths and their community strengths to come into the process of healing and recognize and support that that happens through arts, that happens through music, lots of different ways. And also by engaging in community activism to help address some of these things, we have seen incredibly positive outcomes and healing for both young people and adults. So I think you're absolutely right. We have to move beyond the ivory tower definition of what evidence-based means and really start to encourage and bring in alternative mo models and give them the opportunity through investment to um, do this work. You know, the out of school time work. I know there's there's issues with the budget for the out of school time programs in Chicago right now. That to me is essential. We know that those adults that are in kids' lives all the time, those coaches, those ministers, those Girl Scout leaders, they have a critical role to play too. So we need to be investing in promoting that really early intervention and education. And that's going to take a big change in how we think about and measure the impact of the work that we do. Thanks, Colleen. I, I completely agree. And I think, um, you know, really, you I, I agree with this question and kind of where where we're headed. We want radical change. And what does that mean? And I think um, really creating spaces and systems that allow us to bring our full selves and to be able to um, be celebrate who we are, celebrate each other, but also to evolve 
grow. And I think, you know, it is very true thinking about our traditional mental health system and how do we build services? How do we support our providers doing that work? How do we really wrap around the clinician, you know, um, Kieran mentioned around provider burnout, as well as really embracing those who are doing the work every day who may not have mental health experience. And so I think a lot of the work we've learned at CDPH through this is building up communities to help people feel equipped and feel more confident with tools that they can have um, to help support the connections they're building. Um, I also just want, I would be remiss not to mention power differentials um, and how we set up our systems and how that can create trauma or to really set us back. And so really encouraging everyone to share the power that you have in whatever space that you have it. And to really, for us to continue to challenge that and think, cause I think life can be very fast paced and something that we may not even think twice about could really impact someone, especially depending on what position we hold work or in the community. And so um, I think it's great to think creatively and really invite all voices to challenge what we might think of and then consider what resources are available to for, to help us get there, right? Because if we're, all, if we're only counting on five people, it's going to look different than if we're able to bring everyone into the process. Thank you. Okay, so I would just agree with Kathy and Colleen. <laughs> I really want to piggyback on what Colleen had mentioned too about um, early intervention and how everything starts, you know, early and it does take time. But I know that with, you know, uh, people being engaged and building those relationships, um, Colleen mentioned a lot of great things like that and just being involved. And like I mentioned before, asking questions. Um, I know that the question also asked about allowing undocumented individuals, um, but you know we do want to build those relationships where it does not matter where what community you come from or how much income you have per year. Um, this is something that is just a human right, right? And like so, for everyone to feel safe within their space, um, it shouldn't matter what your race is or your status. Um, so that's uh, that, that was a very um, the important thing that you brought up in that question. Um, so we do want to mention that we are building those relationships. Um, me, myself, with a lot of other peers at Kofi Power Pack, uh, we are uh, bilingual and we are out in communities and trying to ask questions and help our community members and feel to feel safer and feel how we can help and how we can take their questions and their um, concerns back to the table and back to these spaces where we can continue to work together. Um, but yeah, um, also what Kathy mentioned, everybody should be able to be their best self, um, especially in something that they feel very passionate about. So um, yeah, we will continue to build those relationships and um, build within those uh, specific resources that we know that can help us move the work forward. Thank you for that question. Thanks. Rosalia, I, kn I knew you were going to ha have some good thoughts on that one. And I did peek into the chat really quickly and um, saw a quick comment about the importance of lived expertise um, that I, you know, I know we, we all really value um, among this group. Kieran, did you want to add something to that question or should we take another audience question? I think we can keep going. Thanks so much, Gita. Um, Hannah, what do you have next for us? Um, there is an interesting question from Janice about um, ambient air pollution and the effect on individuals. So this question says, increasingly, studies are showing a correlation between ambient air pollution with neurodivergent disorders or diseases. We continue to board vulnerable students on diesel fueled buses when electric vehicle school buses are now an option. Is there a concern with harmful air particulates and public health impacts, particularly on our pediatric and adolescent population to shift this paradigm to not address we are participatory in both increasing and sustaining inequities? I think I can maybe comment on this broadly, um, maybe not so specifically as um, <clears throat> as the questioner is, is, is asking about, but I think we know um, climate change is real, like let's just level set on that. 
Um, we know that um, it's going to have significant public health impacts. We're already seeing them now. Uh, we're seeing um, increasing numbers of what were previously considered um, tropical diseases uh, in the American South. Um, and that kind of thing, um, like potentially malaria, potentially tick-borne diseases, is only going to grow over time. So I think it's really important that uh, public health uh, really consider what those changes are, uh, particularly because um, the impacts of climate change are disproportionately going to impact people of color and people living in poverty. And um, to your point, I think um, it's not, this is sort of that, that comment is based on some of the historical issues we've been, we've seen uh, related to environmental injustice. It's people of color and low income people that predominantly suffer the consequences of, of those issues. So um, I think I would just close by saying it's really important to think carefully about this kind of stuff. It's really important to uh, consider the potential implications um, please feel free to reach out to me if you have specific questions about this issue, and I'm happy to work with colleagues to, to address it. Thank you. I wonder, Gita, if I could comment on the neurodivergent issue, because I think that's also important. Um, there was more than one question about that, I think. I so saw that. Yeah, mm -hmm. that what we know and, and what we just heard from my colleague, that lots of environmental factors are impacting neuro, neurodivergence in our country at the same time as we're seeing these high rates of trauma and the exposure to trauma for so many. And so I just want to highlight that I think that's really important. And just as we heard before, that trauma has a more, is is not, anyone can experience it, right? So when we talk about lived ex expertise, I'm sure there's not a person on this call today who hasn't experienced some type of trauma. And we know that it's not distributed equally. So we know that our BIPOC populations, our rural populations, our Native American populations are all overrepresented in terms of their impact. The other thing though that we know is that neurodivergent or folks with developmental disabilities or medical disabilities are also more likely to experience trauma. And so that is another reason why it's so important that we think about the issue of schools, because schools is an early childhood we're trying to, we hope we'll expand the K-12 work with REACH into early childhood in the next year. But what we know is that when you identify trauma experience and exposure early, that's when you have your best chance of addressing the cognitive impact of that. And some of that is additive. So if there's developmental disabilities, as well as neurodivergence and trauma, having educators and frontline staff in every setting from preschool to um, after school programs, like I mentioned before, or healthcare settings that are able to understand the multiple causes that lead to some of the dysregulation of behavior or uh, cognitive abilities that understand that trauma is a piece of that and can address that in the interventions is really important. So I just want to make sure that we, part of the goal of the task force is to make sure that those voices are heard. So if that's an important voice that could get overlooked, please reach out to a member of the task force and make sure that we know what's going on around this type of work. Similarly, we've had people reach out around specifically grief. We want to make sure that the most universal experience of trauma in our country is grief in the world. Every person will experience loss. So how are we addressing grief in our trauma responsive efforts, right? So we really wanna make sure that we are trying to bring together as many people as possible. And we know that there are some of you that are passionate and knowledgeable, deeply knowledgeable and with experience around some of these issues and please bring those forward. Yeah, it re this reminds me of the Lieutenant Governor's comments in the beginning about how trauma can be nuanced. And I think neurodivergence and the intersections with um, you know, other inequities is is one of those nuances that we can't ignore in, in the work that we're doing. Hannah, do you have a final question for the panelists um, before we start to wrap up for the day? Yes. So I think there are a lot of great questions. Some of them have already been answered a little bit throughout the panel. So I'm going to lift up one. I'm going to ad lib it a little bit. But the mm -hmm. question is really in light of recent global and local issues such as emerging conflict and violence in different parts of the world. 
What strategies would you recommend to help our communities heal and thrive when many are merely in survival mode? How can we foster resilience and support mental health amidst these challenges? So I think this question is really asking when there is a increased global temperature of conflict and crises, how do we foster resilience and mental health uh, endurance? I'd like to have the answer to that myself. So <laughs> panelists, how, how do we, how do we resolve this? Um, maybe I'll, I'll take a, <clears throat> I'll take a stab. Um, so I think first as leaders, just like simple acknowledgement can go a long way, followed by um, some space making. Um, not everyone wants to talk about their traumas at work, obviously, um, but some people do appreciate the opportunity to have discussion. And, and I've seen that done in, a re in really thoughtful ways previously, and, and it's been incredibly helpful. For my own agency, um, when I have staff that are impacted um, and um, there are issues um, happening that are nationwide or you know, at, on, the, on the global stage, I think, um, of course, there is being very clear as a leader what resources are available. I think that's critical. Um, and then finally, I think it's thinking a little bit about, um, again, systems um, and how systems are set up to support staff um, as they struggle through processing whatever trauma may be happening. Um, and finally, I would say, I, I, I simply don't think, I, I think it would be um, incredibly arrogant to, to think that we can address everything. Um, and so again, that's why I'd want to just start with that simple step of acknowledging. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. I wonder too, if we can go back to the idea from the Lieutenant Governor of hurt people hurt people and healing people helps to decrease um, that likelihood. And so I think just remembering that in a time of crisis, we saw it in the pandemic, we see it now with the global news, children are looking at the adults. And so we have to support parents and adults to take care of themselves, to sort out and make sense of what is happening in their world so that they can then help lower the temperature, lower the confusion, address the fears of their children. If we're not taking care of adults um, and helping them feel okay that they have safe spaces where they can talk about what they're concerned and worry about, what we know is that they're gonna act out on those fears. And it's very possible for adults to narrow their focus into their own immediate family, instead of having that more global openness and willingness to support one another and see the similarities across our country and world versus the differences. So I think it's a reminder, even as a child psychologist, I talk a lot about kids, but if we don't take care of adults and give them tools, we're not gonna be able to um, have the role models that our children and young people need to um, avoid escalating conflict and violence. Rosalia, I know you were unmuting before. <clears throat> Oh, yeah. Um, I was just going to mention that I agree with um, both what they have said, Colleen and Kiran. Um, but I also wanted to mention how, um, sadly, we can't fix everything all at the same time, right? Uh, we wish we could. We wish we had, you know, more power to fix all these issues that surround us. Uh, but the re reality is that um, we will always have, you know, an issue surrounding us. And we just have to stick together and adapt and be strong and also, um, like Colleen had mentioned, just, you know, being together, building those relationships, like taking care of our adults, our children, and also focusing on, you know, the glass half full and not half empty. I know that Kofi, uh, at Kofi, we like to really practice that a lot. Um, we know that it is, even within ourselves, it's difficult to build relationships within community. Um, Kiran mentioned it, not everyone feels comfortable enough to share their traumas. Not everyone is ready to be part of that change. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, you can't focus on the people that are ready and then um, give them knowledge and possibly them, you know, pass on the knowledge and pay it forward. And I feel like that's very important to just always keep in mind um, that there will be pe people in general or anything in general that will be a barrier 
But um, it's very important to stay true to what your work is and what you believe in. So even if you feel like the whole world around us is probably, you know, not ideal, um, it's okay to shift that and be like, but you know what, this, this is working, right? So let's talk about what is working and how we can continue it so it can keep working and keep making those changes. Um, because if we focus on all the negativity and all of that, you know, it's, it, it's just not always a great thing. Um, but those things are the, just the truth. It's reality. That's what's happening. But I do think it's very important to just focus on the positive and um, not drown in all the noise outside of the work that you're doing, which is great work. So just continue that over. I just wanted to mention. Yeah. I, um, you know, I needed some inspiration today. And Rosalia, I think what you said about staying true to what you believe in and staying true to what you want to accomplish is something I'm going to take forward into my day um, and and hopefully will stick with me. Uh, the part I hate about moderating the most is that we actually have to conclude. Um, and so I'm sad to say that this does bring us to the end of today's panel, but I know, I, I know I'd enjoy spending a half a day with all of you, uh, learning more from each of you, um, and in dialogue, and I'm sure our audience feels the same way. Um, but Kathy, Colleen, Rosalia, Kieran, I really want to thank each of you for sharing your time and your wisdom with us. I hope you're also taking something away from the conversation this morning too. So we really appreciate you and so glad to be doing this work with you. So I am going to pass the uh, mic back to Kate McCormack this morning uh, to close us out. And um, thanks for allowing me to moderate such a, um, such a motivational discussion this morning. Yes, that was um really, really great. Thank you all so much. And I, uh, Gita and I were kind of communicating and I kept saying, oh, let them go longer. Let's do another question. Like, this is so great. So um, yes, I feel like I learned a lot and lots to follow up on. So thank you. Thank you all so much for that. Um, so we will send out more of a, we'll send out a detailed list of this for everyone because I know we're at the end. So I'm going to kind of just speed through this um, quickly. But our general calls to action, we have a lot of specific things in these categories as you'll get in the email. But just trying to stay informed, as Kathy mentioned, there's that can be a challenge, right? There's lots of great stuff going on, but um, if you're not quite on the right list serves or things, sometimes we can miss it. So I would encourage people today um, to specifically follow some of the work of these these groups. These ones health and medicine is involved in today. There's obviously plenty more, but the Healing Centered Illinois Task Force, um, which you heard mentioned a lot. There's also the Collaborative for Trauma Informed Chicago, which is another initiative. Um, that Kathy is part of as well, and, and many people from that office and also health and medicine, we will eventually be looking for more people for subcommittees. There's gonna be a survey I'm gonna ask Chicago folks to take to pick a logo that we'll put in our follow-up email and some more information on that. Um, another initiative that's really active that's been going a bit longer is Illinois Children's Behavioral Health Transformation led by Dr. Dana Weiner, and they put out um, a progress report in January, 2024. So those are all ways to stay informed. Um, and then, of course, supporting community workplace change, which we know probably everyone on this call is involved in in some way. Um, and the Cook County Department of Health um, has had some great work in that area. And we also have a hospital working group that we support through Health and Medicine, um, looking at specifically these trauma-informed committees um, in hospitals where the staff themselves are trying to spread it. Of course, Colleen is connected with schools doing that type of work. Um, so we'll put some more specific things, but supporting community and workplace change. And then of course, attending another training, lots of organizations on this call have great training. Illinois ACES has some training. CDPH has just launched, um, a really important, um, question per se, re refer suicide prevention training, um, that I think are, those are so important and they really give people skills to have some of the com hard conversations. So I actually feel like sometimes these, um, suicide prevention trainings, I would say is a clinician can help people coming into the space like peer advocates in more ways than just suicide prevention. So those are some of our calls to action. In terms of your personal practice, we would just say keep engaging in your own healing journey. Consider attending a group like a parent cafe or a NAMI support group, uh, maybe to challenge yourself a little bit or see what's going on. And of course, engaging in reflection or reflective supervision. Um, so thank you all so much. Um, we've got like two minutes here. So just housekeeping, remember to log out 
on the CEU sheet. If you had trouble signing in or out, feel free to contact us. We'll try to try to help you. Um, and then also we're going to put in a link to our event evaluation into the chat. So that would be really helpful to us um, for feedback on the event. What else you would like to see you staying in touch with us. So if Hannah could put that link into the chat for the evaluation, if you could take one minute before you go to do that, that would be great. And then um, to end our day again for folks, thank you for staying with us. I see we still got a good number of folks with us here today. So just to end our day on more of a trauma-informed note, we would ask, and you can put it in the chat or just think think it to yourself, but um, we would love to have a few in the chat at least. If you can end your day with one word about how you are feeling um, after this event, and it's fine if we get a lot of the same ones too. So um, I will say that my, uh, my word is connected. Um, so thank you all again for attending and for all the work you do each day to help transform Illinois into a trauma-informed and healing-centered state. We're going to leave the chat open for one minute as people are doing that evaluation and hopefully putting your one word in there. Um, and I will refer back to my uh, my wonderful um, parent leaders from King County. Hacemos el camino al andar. We make the road by walking. Um, so I hope that we gave you some more ideas um, for your journeys today. And again, thank you all for being with us. So we will just leave it open for another minute, but then we will end the recording and close out. So that is the end of the program today. Thank you, everyone.